when you live your life on the edge of evil and danger, like I do, you need all the help you can get. This new kit may be a whole lot more than I bargained for, but it's what I need. And everybody needs a friend when you're running in the night. Coming in one week, the two-hour premiere. Production 60214, Night of the Juggernaut. This episode was written by Robert Foster and Burton Armas, and was directed by George Fennedy. Now, this episode originally had the working title of simply The Juggernaut before they added Night Of in front of it. It originally aired on NBC Friday night, 8 p.m., September 20th, 1985. This was the season four premiere. It was filmed from June 24th through July 16th, 1985, and it was the 64th episode to air and the 64th episode to be produced, which is kind of rare, right? Usually uh, the airing versus production is way out of order, but in this case, um, this was the first episode filmed for season four. And actually, in season two and season three, both those premieres, Goliath and Night of the Drones, were not the first ones filmed for their respective seasons. So um, this is kind of a rarity that they started the season with the actual season premiere. The synopsis reads as follows. Devin is kidnapped and replaced with a clone while Michael is in Chicago safeguarding a rare isotope. There is a ton to unpack here, so we had better get started, don't you think? Now, your video isn't glitching. We're not skipping to halfway through the video or through the episode. Um, What I'm doing is actually backing up to the teaser that aired Uh, in front of the original NBC version. And the reason I'm doing this is because this teaser was unique in that it had a voiceover from Edward Mulhair. He said, this is Edward Mulhair tonight, a special two-hour Knight Rider from Chicago. This is the only episode that has such a voiceover. And it's funny, I'm going to share a little personal story, a quick one with you. So back um, when I first, the first time I saw Night of the Juggernaut was not on NBC. It was on reruns on WWOR um, in late 1980. 80 in the late 1980s like 88 89 somewhere around there and i always saw the syndicated version and it never had the teaser in front of it so um, in the very early 90s there was a sci-fi mail order uh, catalog and it had all kinds of weird stuff weird sci-fi stuff in it at the time and i remember there was a section where you could buy knight rider audio cassettes and all they were and I'm not sure I realized this at the time, all they were is someone recorded the episodes, just the audio of the episodes from the original NBC airing, and this company sold the audio cassettes. Try getting away with that these days, right, for copyright and everything. Anyways, so I bought the audio cassette of Night of the Juggernaut because I had never seen, at that point, I had never seen the full uncut version. And when I got the audio cassette, put it in my player and hit play, I heard that Um, voiceover from Edward Mulher for the very first time and I thought how cool was that and then of course I listened to the whole thing and I heard the other bits that were cut out in syndication and it was it was pretty neat at the time that was the only access I had to you know the, the full uncut version of this episode so next we've got um this turbo boost and this so this is from the opening theme song the opening intro of this specific episode. Why do I bring this up, right? These are obviously clips from season three's uh, The 19th Hole. Night of the Juggernaut is another one of those rarities, kind of like Night of the Drones, that has a unique one-episode-only intro. Because what they were trying to do at the time, remember, at this point, no one had seen Super Pursuit Mode yet. And if you, you know, if you know the show in season, the season four credits have super pursuit mode in them and the convertible, um, quite a bit. So whenever this originally aired on NBC on September 20th of 1985, um, they wanted to keep the super pursuit and convertible a secret until they were, they actually were shown in the episode. So because of that, we have this unique opening credits where instead of, us seeing the convertible, we see this turbo boost, and instead of seeing Super Pursuit later, we just see the regular kit. And even the commercial breaks, where, you know, the screen, um, you know, fades off and we see kit coming at us through the desert. In Night of the Juggernaut, all of those commercial breaks are still the regular kit. And it's not until the very end of the episode, when you see the created by uh, Glenn A. Larson, you know, the, the final scene, that we see the super pursuit mode in the desert. But then starting with the next episode for the rest of season four, all the breaks 
are the Super Pursuit Mode car and not the regular. And now we see um, this GMC Astro uh, coming up, hauling the Juggernaut. This is one of Universal Studios' transportation GMC Astros uh, on part of their fleet. Um, you know, number any pretty much any time you see a GMC Astro in Knight Rider, it's part of Universal's fleet. There's a number of episodes. Um, you know, uh, night moves, uh, inside out, 10 wheel trouble. They all have the GMC Astro. There's tons of episodes with that. Um, one thing to note this episode, by the way, was not a hundred percent filmed in the Chicago area. There were a number of scenes that were filmed in the Los Angeles area as well. Um, the garage where kit is repaired, uh, where kits destroyed, uh, the airport at the end of this episode, uh, the Cernium 116, vault exterior locations those were all filmed in chicago in fact i know this is a little bit of a sidebar but the knight rider semi was actually never even in chicago it appears that it is because it's used heavily in this episode it was never even in chicago those were all filmed in los angeles but this particular scene was filmed in chicago so this gmc astro they did drive across the country uh, probably to haul the juggernaut machine that that was probably its sole reason for for being out there um, this was on lakeshore drive in Chicago, uh, somewhere near Randolph Street and Monroe Street. And um, I, it's built up quite a bit since then, but uh, this is a genuine Chicago location. And in the driver's seat of the GMC Astro is Al Jones, who we've mentioned a number of times. He's part of the Knight Rider crew. And, um, you know, we've seen him tons of times throughout the series. He drove the car carrier in the ice band. It's the one that Kit Turbo was on top of. He drove Goliath back in Goliath and Goliath Returns. And um, in this episode, he actually has uh, a speaking part. Just He just says uh, just a couple lines right in the scene, but I think it's the only time that he speaks in um, any of his appearances. Okay, it's finally time to talk about the juggernaut. So many people of you, so many of you have asked me about the juggernaut um, over the last couple years, really. And I was kind of holding off and holding off until um, this episode, right? Because this is the appropriate time to talk about the juggernaut. Details are somewhat scarce. So we know it originated, it was originally built for a 1983 movie called Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. And in fact, here's a screenshot of it. You can see it doesn't have the battering ram in front and it looks a little less menacing, right? They have smaller tires on it. It's not quite as jacked up, but this is what will become the juggernaut. Fairly certain that this was built, built by the Valuze brothers, the same ones involved with the Dukes of Hazard. Many, many years ago, I reached out to them on, um, they had a website, I don't know if they still do, but they had a, a section on their website for like army vehicle rentals and they didn't specifically have the juggernaut on there but i thought well if anyone built something like this maybe it was them right so i reached out to them and they did confirm at the time that they built this um and they didn't really provide me i couldn't find i couldn't find the email like i said this was 10 or 15 maybe 20 years ago but i couldn't find the record of when i talked to them at the time but they did tell me that it no longer exists that it was, um, I don't know if it was, I think it was scrapped. Uh, so it's no longer around, but pretty sure that they were the ones that built it. Now, um, in the script for Night of the Juggernaut, this is how the, when the first time we see the Juggernaut, this is how it's described. Half tank, half armored vehicle. It's an awesome sight. A 16 foot battering ram protruding from its turret. The driver, Hauer, faces a control panel that rivals Kit's. Right. And if you watch the episode, I mean, to start the juggernaut, he has to sw switch like, I don't know, 30 switches, press buttons and all this stuff. seems like it should just be a turn of a key. But anyways, um, one other note here regarding the juggernaut. So um, we have some production notes on the, the dailies that as they were filming each day, they would come back and look at the footage they shot, the dailies. And um, they, the dailies noted, the early dailies noted um, that the location made good use of Chicago, but some reshooting may be required in the opening sequence on the lot. The disappointing juggernaut has been redesigned. And then it also says the production team is still learning how to use Super Pursuit Mode effectively. But I thought that was interesting because in the episode itself, 
we see the juggernaut redesign right at the very beginning here we see it's got some blue accents and it's silver it doesn't have that giant um great on the front and halfway through the episode you see them working on it right they're they're um adding additional they added the contact detonating tip and the um that uh, guard in front of it and they kind of paint repainted it all like this matte color and i don't think that was the original intent i think that came down from the studio because um they felt like it needed to be redesigned so that's why the look changes on the juggernaut halfway through the episode and like i say this was on lakeshore drive um and if we this if we look at this high rise in the background this rounded building that helps really identify where it was so right so there's that building today um not sure what the discrepancy is with this wall here i'm guessing this must have been rebuilt at some point because i looked all around i couldn't match that perfectly but that's clearly that same building so um if we look at it from this direction and then we get this point of view shot we can see that it's similar this might not be the 100 percent exact location but it's got to be really close because that building's right there okay let's continue all right, now we get our first look at Michael and Ken in the episode, and this debuts the brand new insert car for season four. Um, as we talked about a lot in season three, the season three insert car had a whole bunch of issues by the end of the season. The roof was leaking, um, and it just wasn't quite as put together. So for season four, they brought in a brand new 1984 Trans Am that had an interior only conversion. The outside of this car was still a stock black and gold Trans Am. Uh, and it was the only car uh, ever used where they never converted the outside of it. So they this was only the insert car and never anything more. Now we do have better shots than this one of the, the this black and gold insert car, but um, we don't have the permission to show them, unfortunately. So um, this one... Uh, was given to us by Bill Pervians. Now, Bill was one of Knight Rider's car carrier um, drivers, right? And he provided this awesome, awesome photo from later in season four. But if you look right here, um, let me see if I can, yeah, it's hard to zoom in there, but right there, you can see how it still has the gold trim on it, right? So this was the only car they ever had that never had an exterior conversion. It was gold all the way through the end of the series. And while we're talking about the cars, let's just get it out of the way now. Knight of the Juggernaut used 13 kit cars. Isn't that unbelievable? 13 kit cars. I think this might be the most cars used in a single episode. So let's go through those 13. Number one, the roll cage acrylic window jump car. Number two, the Fliver car, which we haven't seen much of in season three. The Fliver car is back, and we'll see it a couple more times in season four. For those of you not familiar with the Fliver car, we actually did an entire video on this specific car. Um, it was a Volkswagen-powered dune buggy jump car, so you probably want to check that out. There's a lot of cool information in there. We've got the season three and four hero car. We have this car, new to the series, the convertible. We've got the primered doorless kit that they are putting back together. And I have some very interesting information about this specific car, which I'll share with you when we get to this part of the episode. The right-hand blind drive car, used only for this one scene in the entire episode. The hardtop stunt car, the same hardtop stunt car that we've had on the show since uh, middle of season one. Our uh, kind of general purpose T-top stunt car that debuted at the beginning of season three. We've got this uh, new season four insert car. We've got this different hardtop stunt car, which we'll talk about when we get there. The super pursuit mode car. This poor hardtop stunt car that got destroyed. This trailer half convertible car. And that's it. Technically, actually, though, there is kind of a 14th car, right? Because whenever we see the transforming scenes, the car, the Super Pursuit Mode transformation scenes, that's actually a completely different car. That's the uh, Acid Pit car from Junkyard Dog. So I guess there's 14 cars technically in this episode. That's just nuts. 
close up of Kit's voice box. Um, one minor change that they made to the voice box between season three and season four is this normal light. In season three, it actually says normal cruise. By season four, they change it to just normal. However, auto cruise, you can't see it here, but it still says auto cruise like it did in season three. But normal cruise is now normal. And here we have two returning Knight Rider guest stars. We've got both from season three. We've got Nicholas Worth on the left, who we last saw as Riles in uh, Night of the Chameleon. And on the right, we have Mr. Boyd LaSalle himself, John Considine, from season three's Night in Disgrace. This is kind of an often overlooked detail about uh, Philip Nordstrom as the character. I mean, of course, he has this... Um, like robotic hand or strength in hand or whatever. But what's interesting to note is how he carries himself, specifically in this first scene. Later in the episode, his hand kind of acts more like, I mean, whenever it's at rest, it looks like a regular hand. But here, he really works hard to make it look like a mechanical hand. So he holds it up real stiff-like, and obviously they put a ton of makeup on it to make it look kind of fake. And then as he's walking, you can see his arm, His this arm is um, kind of swinging normally, like, it would as you walk this one he has real stiff and he holds his pointer finger on his thumb together like it's you know a, a, like a mechanical arm at rest but it's a detail that most people don't really pick up on like i said later in the episode when you see him he doesn't really hold it like that so it's just in these this first scene with him establishing shot of michael and kit entering chicago look very closely and what do we see the family truckster from national lampoon's vacation which I think was 1983, wasn't it? And I believe this footage was also used in the opening uh, shots for the Married with Children television show intro. So uh, any question if Michael Knight and Clark Griswold, and I guess Al Bundy, are in the same shared universe, this is your answer. They are. So in the interest of time, because there's so much to cover, I'm not going to... Go over every single filming location because there's a ton of them i'll just do a few select ones this is still lakeshore drive in chicago and uh this is uh kit turning on to i think madison avenue in chicago um you know feel free to to uh look at these locations now um if you want some of them are pretty much the same as they were back then some are quite different so take a look at this once again um look at the crowd right all those people in the background are all have all come out to watch a Knight Rider being filmed, which I think is just really, really cool. And especially this scene, the one and only scene in the episode with the right hand blind drive car where you see just all these people. Just look at this. Look at all these people um, that came out, all three levels. There's people up top in the middle and down below that came to see Knight Rider being filmed. And this is a really neat thing because you know, Kit's driverless here and he, he goes down the street. All these people are really close. He does a 180, um, you know, right in front of their faces. That must have been really, really amazing to see. And of course, uh, Michael and uh, RC stop these muggers. And one of the muggers is Jack Gill making yet another cameo appearance. And what would Knight Rider's fourth season be without Peter Peros? Yeah, Peter joins the show in this episode as Reginald Cornelius III, RC3 for short. And uh, we talked to Peter Paris many years ago. He said he competed with a then unknown actor named Blair Underwood for the chance to act alongside Hasselhoff and the team. The audition went down to the wire until Paris impressed the network with a cheeky but inspiring poem. The audition process was very exciting for me. I always wanted to play an action hero, and that's how I saw RC3. This was a role I really wanted and I thought I was perfect for. I had read for Donna Dockstader, the casting director, a couple of times before, and she liked my work. As I recall, I had four auditions, and at my final audition, it was down to me and Blair Underwood. The network and the producers were all there. It was a morning audition, and we were told that whoever got the part would be leaving for Chicago that afternoon. So I did my scenes, and just before I walked out of the room, I turned back and announced, I'm badder than Mr. T and prettier than Ali, so hire me for RC3. I was young and crazy, but my corny poem worked. I had won the role for RC3, and that afternoon I was on a plane to Chicago. And um, even though Blair Underwood didn't get the role of RC3, he did get a consolation prize. He's one of the um, uh, car thieves, or potential car thieves, later in the episode, which we'll cover. So Paris went on to just say uh, about his time in Chicago. He said it was unusually hot and not very windy um, whenever they were there. 
And um, what else did he say? He said he'd never actually been to Chicago. Um, he had no connection with the city before the show. Um, but within hours, he was flown first class out there. And then as soon as he got there, he was in wardrobe to be fitted for his Street Avenger costume. During this specific scene where there's this brawl in the alleyway, he says, the fight in the alley was the very first scene that I shot. We actually shot the sequence out of order. It was my first screen fight, and we rehearsed it at half speed several times. When it came time for the actual shoot at full speed, our timing and positioning got off a bit after I tackled the bad guy and actually punched him in the mouth and split his lip. I was horrified. The stuntman was bleeding, and the crew thought it was funny. The stunt guy was a pro because he finished the scene, then they took him off to the hospital to get stitches. I'm sure he got a bonus for his injury, but that was definitely not the way to start the day. In fact, I thought I was going to get fired. Um... But he said, obviously, he didn't get fired. But he said after that incident, Burton Armis, producer, jokingly started calling him Peter One Punch, a nickname that stuck through the rest of the season. And we have more establishing shots of Michael and Kit driving through the city. And, of course, the glass dome here kind of gives it away. It's still there, although very, very hard to see with all the um, trees growing up around it. 427 East Randolph Street in Chicago, if you want to explore a little more. And then Michael and Kit magically arrive at the Cernium Vault, which is um, actually in Los Angeles, right? Here's Spring Street in Los Angeles. So they went from Chicago to Los Angeles just by going around a corner. Lots of modern props um, items were used in this episode, including this palm reader right here that uh, Devin's about to use. You can see he's about to place his hand on this red uh, uh, palm reader with a uh, grid. Of course, then we see the up close and it's green and totally different, but that's all right. And all this stuff in the background, this is all modern props, right? Um, and if you look off to the left here, you can just start to see one of the Entrex data scopes. This used to be in the semi. Um, it used to be red and was in the semi, but now here it is as a prop over here. We'll see it a little bit closer here in a minute. And of course, we have Pamela Susan Shoup returning. Um, her last appearance was way back in the pilot as Maggie. Here she is in, in season four as Marta Simmons. Interesting, she was the guest star on the first episode of the first season and the last season. So it's kind of a nice little bookend there. And then we turn to Jennifer Knight's estate. Um, this is another Los Angeles location that they used. Um, you'd think it was just this establishing shot, but we actually see it was filmed here as well. Um, this house is still there, looks pretty much like it did back then. According to Google, it's the St. John of God Retirement and Care Center. Um, so there you go. Looks identical. Nothing has changed on that. Mary Kate McGeehan. So this is her one and only appearance in the series playing Jennifer Knight, yet another relative of the Knight family, right? So at this point, we've got Wilton Knight, and Elizabeth Knight, who had Garth and Jennifer. And that's, I guess, the Knight family history. I don't think we've ever learned of an additional child, at least not yet. Um, we talked to Mary many, many years ago, and she talked specifically about um, this scene in the boardroom. She said she had memorized the scene, which was an important one. It was the only, as it was the true introduction to Jennifer Knight. Before we shot the scene, I was running over my lines when I noticed that the lines I had were not the lines we were just about to shoot. I'm not sure exactly what happened or why, but somewhere along the line, someone forgot to give me the rewrite. It was sheer panic time as I quickly had to learn an entire new scene, including that long monologue speech, which you see in the episode. Also, I needed to do it in record time as the entire cast and crew waited and time is money. I dug deep and managed to pull it off. And whenever I go back and watch it, I don't think anyone could ever tell that I had just learned it. I was proud of myself for getting it together and making it work. And interesting note, um, this was not the first time that she had met David Hasselhoff. They actually worked together years before on The Young and the Restless. So a few other notes while we're talking about Jennifer. So backing up a little bit, when Michael meets up with Devin at the Cernium 116 vault, this was after Devin had dropped the bombshell on Michael that um, she wanted to phase out flag. There's an additional scene in the script that is not in the episode where Michael wants answers as to why Jennifer Knight wants to close down the foundation. Michael makes the comment, Devin, you tell me to come to Chicago ASAP. 
Jennifer Knight's taking an active role in the foundation and the number one thing on her agenda, and I quote, number one is to phase out the foundation for law and government. That's us, you, me, Bonnie, and Kit. Devin replies, we deserve to exist. How could anyone, particularly anyone named Knight, decide differently? And then there's also an additional scene in the script um, that takes place here in the boardroom. When Jennifer first meets Michael, she vocalizes her displeasure in sharing the same last name with him. She says, please be seated, Michael. I hope you don't mind me calling you Michael. I have difficulty attaching the family name to you. Michael responds, since your father saw fit to give it to me, and since he had it long before you had it, I think we should both respect his wishes. Jennifer then says, my father, as you well know, is dead. I'm not. I carry the name now, and I refuse to have it attached to violence and a vigilante state of mind. Um, and then one additional piece from this scene. So uh, Michael, you know, stands up and kind of defends the foundation and... Um, in that scene, it's a very, very well done scene, but there's actually a little bit more dialogue to that that we don't hear in the actual episode. So uh, Michael says, uh, he, meaning Wilton Knight, he chose to save the basis of charity and caring, the law. Without it, there's nothing. No cusps or quantum leaps. With it, there's a chance. That's all we want, to guarantee that chance. If it takes going through a wall, we go through a wall. Walls can be fixed. Really, really good stuff. This was really good writing. This, What did make it and what didn't make it into this episode. And a little bonus for you guys. So a few years ago, um, we talked to Gina Grimaldi's um, family. Gino, unfortunately, uh, passed a while back. But uh, we talked to their family and they shared these really cool behind-the-scenes photos um, of Gino from multiple episodes throughout his career on Knight Rider. But I want to show these specific ones because it has Mary Kate in it and Gino Grimaldi and the convertible kit, as you can see here. So Mary's drinking a Diet Coke. She's got her script here highlighted with uh, her lines. We see kind of a good look at the dash on the convertible. You can see there's no voice box in it. The dash is all stickers. And we'll get another look at this later on in the episode. So inside in the board meeting, we get this nice videotape um, summary, I guess, of some of Michael and Kit's more destructive activities, right? They're trying to prove that Flag is, that he's a vigilante and he just destroys stuff. So what do we see here? We've got this scene from Lost Night. We've got this scene from season two's Nightmares when the cops are chasing Michael and Kit. This scene was actually never in an episode. Um, it might look like it was, right? It reminds you of Kit turbo boosting through the train in season two's A Knight in Shining Armor, but this is actually an outtake from that episode. In the actual aired episode, Kit jumps through an open box car, but here he's turbo boosting through a closed box car and it's breaking pieces everywhere. And I think they probably didn't use this in the episode because the model car kind of, it's not a, you know, once it hits the train, it kind of, turns a little bit and veers off course it's not really a, a good piece of footage right so they decided to use an open box car but we do see it right here and then of course we see this scene also from season two from a good night's work and of course this begs the question was the knight foundation following michael and kit with a camera to capture all this stuff right Devin is captured by Philip Nordstrom, and the idea is obviously to have this guy get plastic surgery to uh, make him look like Devin. So first, can we acknowledge that this guy, this actor, really looks like Edward Mulhare? Like, it's not hard to see. I think he's got a wig on. But you could actually kind of see the resemblance. So I have a challenge for you guys. Can any of you identify this actor? Because he's not credited in the episode. I have no idea who he is. But it'd be kind of interesting to talk to him, don't you think? He was really literally only in this one brief scene. Um, according to the script, you know, in the episode, they call him Mr. Elliot. His first name, according to the script, is Jonathan, Jonathan Elliot. Um, there's also an additional scene right after this that shows um, Devin's palm prints being copied and uh, Jonathan Elliot listening to recordings of Devin's voice to be able to mimic his um, his speech patterns. But all that, you know, was in the script, but didn't make it in the episode. We've now moved to the outside of Marta's apartment. This is on North Edgemont Street in Los Angeles. 
Uh, again, another filming location, supposedly in Chicago, but actually in Los Angeles. If we look here, this is the hero car. And something kind of neat I wanted to point out. Do you see this silver thing right here? Let me zoom in. Right here. Any ideas what that is? I know what it is. Um, so between season three and season four, this hero car got a brand new front bumper. This is a, uh, this bumper, this specific one, the season four style bumper was um, sculpted and uh, molded and cast by George Barris and his crew at um, you know, Barris Custom City in North Hollywood. And um, this is a rubber bumper and it's reinforced with chicken wire. How do I know all this, right? Because we've got two original cars. One of those two original cars has an original season four bumper on it. So we know exactly how they were created. Um, so what is this thing? This is a piece of aluminum, and it's, it's bent in almost an accordion shape. So you see the front piece, then it bends back, and it bends over here. This, the front of this, and you can't really see it because the shadow, is grafted into the front of the bumper. And this back piece is bolted on to, this, to the um, factory Trans Am bumper impact, the, the metal bar that's across here. And this was, because the bumper was rubber and not fiberglass, this was another way for them to... Um, kind of secure the bumper in the in the middle. There's also these flaps underneath each one of the uh, top pieces of the bumper here. So um, just a way to secure the bumper because you figure it's rubber. Now it's kind of a harder rubber and especially now our bumper is like rock hard because it's 35 years old. But back then it was a little softer and because of that um, they needed to add these extra supports in to keep the bumper kind of um, stable so it didn't move too much. Did you ever notice in this scene when Michael comes in to meet uh, Marta Simmons that Hasselhoff looks up, right? So why is he looking up? It's weird. Like she's talking to him and he just kind of looks up. So the answer to this can be found in the blooper reel. Uh, this scene is in the blooper reel. And in the blooper reel, you hear the actual audio of what's going on. Um, this was this set. This was on a soundstage. This was not the interior of that building we just showed you. This was on a soundstage at Universal. And um, I think I'm almost positive, based on the footage in the um, in the uh, blooper reel, that there was a bird in the stage that was making a lot of noise. And Hasselhoff looks up and um, is looking at that bird while uh, Marta's trying to talk to him. So that's what's going on here. So check out the blooper reel, and you'll see that that uh, clip. You're gonna rip a car, it might as well be new, right? That's kind of the subplot here about how Kit is old. And then he gets destroyed and he has these new features and all is well. But um, this is on the streets of Chicago. This is um, one of our two cars. This is the same car that you saw in Jay Leno's garage many years later when it was still a hardtop car. Um, and it's used fairly heavily in this episode. We'll point out some other scenes where, where we see this car. And... Um, Obviously, just take a minute to look at uh, Artie's outfit. I guess this was your typical punk outfit from 1985 with a necklace made of safety pins, a razor taped to his lapel. You know, that's quite a daring look. And then here is Blair Underwood, which we talked about before. He was up for the role of RC3, didn't make it, so he got this role as a consolation prize. Back in the new insert car... Do you notice um, how Marta or how Pamela Susan Shoup is really like pushed up close? The seat is is not only um, fully forward, but it's actually lifted up here. So look at like where her eye line is versus where the seat is. Uh, for those of you who have a Trans Am, you'll know this is way off, right? They don't, the, the people don't usually sit this high. I think they pulled her up closer to the window so they could frame this shot better. And even Hasselhoff, even Hasselhoff's seat is up much higher than it normally is. So, but the backs of both of these seats were reclined up further than you wouldn't normally have them for whenever you're driving um, a Trans Am. And that's why. They get a little bit more relaxed later in, as the season goes on. But for this episode, for some reason, they're up pretty high. All right, so then we have this sequence where uh, Michael's driving. Um, I think this is probably still Lakeshore Drive during this ambush. I'm not sure. And I'm also not sure. Maybe you guys, you Chicago natives, Eric Wang, um, know, was this piece of this road, 
it looks like it was under construction. And I'm not talking about the props for the cones and the the uh, barriers, but I I feel like this this whole area was was um, still under construction, and that's how Night Rider was able to use it because it, they didn't have to close off traffic in Chicago to be able to film in these locations. So then we see this insert shot, and we do see Hasselhoff's script right down here, um, just barely. And as we move forward, we see the bad guys chasing him. This is Andy Gill, Jack Gill's brother right there. And then we move forward. This is the hardtop stunt car with the um, the rubber shell on top of the car, which we've talked about before. This was the, the body. They molded a uh, rubber shell off a real Trans Am and placed it on top of some of the stunt cars to be able to, you know, um, have them in stunts, but then have them not get... Uh, um, dented or scratched or anything like that. So you can see here, I mean, when you look at it in, in Blu-ray, you can clearly see there's a shell on top of this car, right? You can see the gap here. You can see all the squibs here from all of the, uh, the bullet, you know, the bullet ricochets, the sparks. Um, and then we go back to the insert shot. Now you see the, uh, the clapper board right here, right? Which we didn't see prior. And then we move forward and this is once again, um, our, one of our two cars. Uh, this this car, um, for season three, it had a different bumper. You know, it was just in a couple episodes at the end of season three, which we covered in those respective episode commentaries. But here in the first few episodes of season four, it has a unique bumper that no other Knight Rider car ever had. Um, this is a, a rubber bumper molded uh, by George Barris. And for those of you familiar who have studied, you know, the fourth season style bumper on these cars, normally the tops are completely smooth, right? There's no gaps here. There's no acrylic for turn signals. There's no indents. There's nothing. But this car, we do see something like that, right? We see that this car does have indents, but it's a fourth season style nose. Um, and this was a prototype, I think this was a prototype nose that Barris was, um, playing with before he decided to make the tops completely flush. So it ended up on this car and this car only. A few episodes into season four, uh, the bumper on this car was replaced with the smooth style on the top. And that's the bumper it still has to, to this day. And here's the flipper car coming in for a landing. This is on um, Lakeshore Drive right here. This is where the landing took place. And, you know, I just noticed something. Back at the beginning of this commentary, we talked about the juggernaut and how we couldn't quite line up the walls in the background. But look at here. Let's look how there's a solid wall here, kind of like we saw um, with the juggernaut at the beginning of this episode. Hold on. Let's, let's take a look at that again. Here. Remember this scene from earlier in our commentary? So see how the, the wall is solid right here, but we do see this building in the background. Can we find this exact location? And the answer is yes, we can find it. It's right here. I was just off a little bit whenever I was talking earlier. So this scene at the beginning when they're unloading the juggernaut takes place right here. So that turbo boost that I just showed you with the flipper car was right here. And so the juggernaut was parked right here. And then the, yeah, yeah. And then the um, toll booth would have been right about here. We're back in the Cernium 116 vault and here is a better look at that Entrex data scope. This was the same computer that we saw in the semi in the early first season episodes. It was painted red um, and it had a little box protruding out the back. But I believe, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the exact same one, just now painted gray instead of red. Okay, now we have uh, Michael and Kit parking to meet Marta, which in reality is going to be the ambush that destroys Kit. Spoiler alert. Um, we can see that the hero car has got a little bit of a sticky relay issue on the scanner. This um, filming location is East 3rd Street and Santa Fe Avenue in Los Angeles. Still there today, still looks about the same. Um, you'll see as we progress forward, there they, there's no barriers over on this side like there are now, right? So Kit drove through here and through these two bridge supports, right? So if we go back here, he's driving through these bridge supports right here. So what do we see on the other side? Well, obviously this has all been developed now. You know, the the rows of um, loading docks that you see here are no longer there. So, but this is the location where Kit was destroyed. Be sure to take a peek at our exclusive merch 
not found anywhere else, like our Knight Rider historians and semi-restoration team branded apparel, along with our line of Garthware, trademark pending. T-shirts, hoodies, even coffee mugs in a variety of colors and styles to suit every taste. Your purchase directly supports this channel and helps us to continue bringing you awesome content. View the merch below this video and click on the link in the description for our entire catalog. And we see the juggernaut coming through the brick wall. Um, you know, obviously this was a, fa a facade that that uh, the studio built. But And if you look here, the bricks, they're actually this pink pyrolite, the styrofoam, right? They're not actual bricks that, he's, that it's breaking through. And we're going to walk through the destruction of Kit. There's a lot of neat things you can see in, in this sequence here, right? So first we see the Juggernaut hits the left rear quarter of the car, busts off the blackout right here, right? Hits it. You see pieces of blackout flying just like that. Rips out the, the tail light. You can see the gold um, Trans Am bird right there, right? So this kind of tells us a couple things. Um, assuming these, these, uh, taillight pieces are the original ones to the car. Um, if the fact that this bird is gold, that tells us this car was originally black and gold. Cause I think that's the only time you could get the gold bird on, on a Trans Am like that. But you see here, we've got the destruction has begun. The taillight is now just kind of flopping there. Um, and then the juggernaut hits the rear quarter. You can see the uh, rear hatch glass busts out at that point. So what car is this, right? This is a hardtop car. But from everything that we can tell, this car never appeared in the show prior to this scene. Um, there were, you know, we have the, the general purpose hardtop stunt car that we have seen since... Um, mid season one, right around white bird or chariot of gold, somewhere around there. Um, and then we have our car, right? Our hardtop car that debuted in, um, 10 wheel trouble. And then all of a sudden we have a third hardtop car here that has never been accounted for before. I think this car was built specifically to be destroyed here. It's my guess. We asked uh, Jack Gill about this sequence a couple years ago. Here's what he said. He said um, Jack was the one piloting the juggernaut and Andy is the one you see here pretending to be Michael with the seat reclined. Uh, the juggernaut was one of the most lethal weapons we ever used on Knight Rider only because it went very, very fast and was indestructible. The battering ram at the front is what was so dangerous because it liked to punch through parts of the vehicle. If it had a bigger surface, it probably would only push the car around, but it was a tiny piece of metal and it would try and punch through the doors. So we had to put roll bars inside the doors to protect the driver. I drove the juggernaut and my brother Andy drove Kit. We set up a bunch of shots where I would just beat the car to death and do as much damage as I could without actually hurting Andy. And that's exactly what we see here. Just terrible destruction. When you think of all these rare, now rare Trans Am parts being destroyed. And of course, um, you know, like I said, the car's a hard top. Clearly, if this was a T-top, this would have shattered, not bent, like you see here. Um, what else do we see as we go through the sequence? So, um, about to hit the, yeah, the front of the car. That's a rubber, one of rubber front bumper, brand new rubber front bumper put on the car and then immediately destroyed. We see this scene, the bumper again is hitting the front of the car and now there's a camera set up on the inside. See that camera right there? And that's what the camera was um, uh, filming right here, right? So you got the camera here and then they actually took some of that footage here and then the juggernaut leaves and gets in bad shape and uh, the scanner goes off and you know, that's the end. If this was a fiberglass front bumper, obviously it wouldn't be bent like this. It would just be completely destroyed. And then we see the inside shot of Michael in the car. Because of this um, seat belt trim piece, the way it's designed, we can tell, assuming this is the original to the car, that this was a 1982 car. So it was a 1982 black and gold Trans Am hardtop that they used for this scene. Poor Knight Rider Trans Am, all destroyed. So, <clears throat> oops, I went too far here. So what do we have? Um, not much, right? The car is destroyed. Uh, note that the hubcaps are still on here, but when we go ahead, 
that one has fallen off. Um, but going back here, this is a great, great look at the fake T-top strips that they put on the cars, on the hardtop cars. Um, and we've talked about that before. Um, the two, now I guess three, if you include this one, three hardtop cars that they had on the show, they would put strips on the cars, metal strips that they would rivet to the roof. And you can see here, you can even see the rivets, right? Right here, here, there. And uh, just, just the, and, oh, and also the, the strip across the front here, right? There's, there's uh, rivets right there. So there you go. Back in the semi, um, we see the car, right? And what do we see here? Well, we can see that tail light right here, that the one that was dangling off. We see the hood scoop insert right here. And uh, not too much else. We can kind of see the dash. We see it's a fake dash that's with a plate on the front. Or, I'm sorry, with blanks in the front, no electronics. So this episode also debuts a new computer inside the semi. You know, previously we had been using the uh, Texas Instruments professional computer. Now we've got this HP computer with, with a printer. And this is the, uh, I think this is the hard drive here. All right, so for the syndicated version, this is normally where part two starts, but we don't do syndicated versions around here. This is the full NBC version. Um, this alleyway is on Universal Studios' back lot. This is right around the same place where they filmed like the Alpine Crest scenes from A Nice and Decent Little Town in the opening and, and um, many other episodes. Good Day at White Rock is all in this kind of general area. So another thing I wanted to point out from remembering this when I watched it as a child is this guy right here whenever they're introducing RC's introducing him to Michael you got all these guys saying hi and then you got this guy here and he's he's making a gesture like hey want to arm wrestle I always thought that was uh, just interesting even as a kid I thought well that's an interesting way to say hi but all right so we're inside this warehouse we can see the semi it must be a huge warehouse because the semi's in here we can see the tractor or the sleeper of the tractor right there this episode also debuts this um, advanced, you know, this high-tech uh, toolkit, right? This um, uh, craftsman uh, tool, tool chest, whatever you call it. Um, we hadn't seen it in season three, but in season four, this will be prominently displayed uh, inside the semi. This is the only time we see it outside the semi. Um, Steve Whiteside, who was one of the assistant prop masters on the show, um, a number of years ago, we talked to him, and supposedly he he when the when the series was canceled, he took this and he has this in his garage. Supposedly, there's Michael once again not wearing his comlink, but another inferior watch. Although it almost looks like the the same model, it almost looks like there's the two radio dials there. But I still I think it's different. Nice uh, continuity. Uh, piece here where they actually talk about Garth Knight, which I thought was was kind of neat. It's really the only time, one of the only times outside of Goliath and Goliath Returns that Garth is mentioned. Um, they mentioned, you know, in Blind Spot there's a passing reference, but um, since since uh, Garth's demise in Goliath Returns, there hasn't really been any uh, mentions. And it actually kind of confirms that Garth did die at the end of Goliath Returns because they talk about him in the past tense. So I guess that closes the book on him returning, or maybe not. When I travel, especially in major metropolitan cities, I like to go economy. The cheaper tax company, 555-7364 for all your super cheap taxi needs. Disclaimer, you may not get to go where you need to go. And also we have uh, Hassoff here hiding behind the life section of USA Today newspaper. But when we see a close up, he's holding half of the newspaper upside down. We can see this first page is not upside down, but the rest of it is. So that seems like an error that shouldn't have happened. Michael and Marder are now at the outdoor cafe restaurant. And another thing, just pointing out things I noticed as a kid that, you know, I get to share with you now is this scene where they're Hasselhoff and um, Pamela Susan Schuper acting and all I could ever watch on this scene, I couldn't listen to what they were saying. All I did was watch Hasselhoff's shoe. And you can see here, he just, he plays with the, the tablecloth throughout this scene. And now that I've pointed out to you, anytime you watch a scene, that's all you're going to focus on. You're welcome. 
So now we have Hauer uh, shooting at uh, Michael and Marta. And I always thought this was neat how, um, obviously, it's they weren't shooting real bullets. And it was planned for them to hit this um, canopy, or this, this umbrella, and make it fall. But I thought it was it was neat that they included that here, right? That that Howard was shooting at them and they somehow hit, just happened to hit the pole that this umbrella was on. And for all your car repair needs, be sure to call Auto Repair Domestic and Foreign at 312-QU7-2112. That seems odd, but whatever. All right, so let me see um, this nice shot. RC showing Michael some of the enhancements that they're making to Kit. Interestingly, the enhancements that they show him with uh, this overhead console, this is the same overhead console the car had already in season three. So it's not, he's not, RC's not showing him anything new. It's the console that was already in there. But pretty sure this was a Michael Chaffee design that made it into, into the show here. And if you look, um, there's writing on these LEDs, which you don't see in the actual production piece. And I remember um, in some of Chaffee's uh, speeches, whenever he would he would talk and give a presentation and show some of his behind-the-scenes drawings, I remember that um, these were labeled as circuit breakers. So I think um, that's what you're seeing here. I think this is an original drawing by Michael Chaffee that made it into the show. All right, so we've talked about this a little in the past, but this, this primer doorless kit is actually the very same car that we own, the other car that we own, not the Jay Leno car. This was the original um, backup to the hero car in season one, the insert car in season two, one of the two high traction drop down cars. This is the car you see in the very opening seconds of every single Knight Rider episode when Kid is racing towards you in the desert, is this specific car. This is the same car that is currently in the Peterson Automotive Museum and, um, and we'll be there for a little while longer. Um, so how did we identify this? Well, lots of things, right? So we pulled door panels off. We saw a primer. We saw this same gray primer. We um, can see the weld marks in the door jam where this, this guy was actually welding. Now, he wasn't welding two pieces of metal together. He was just kind of touching the rod to the metal and, you know, leaving behind marks, leaving behind, you know, uh, welding marks. Um, and we found all those exact same marks here. And also, you know, I'll show you here in a minute. You can see some of the um, hydraulic line for the high traction drop downs. We covered this all in a previous video, but this is, and what's really cool is Night of the Juggernaut is the only episode in the entire series, at least that we've identified so far, where both of our screen use cars are in are being are utilized in both the same episodes they were both on set for other episodes but this is the first time they were both actually filmed for a single episode and i was like this first of all the guy was you know spraying while the other guy was welding which is probably not a good thing to do and here he is painting and he didn't even mask off the windshield and you can see the windshield just has a ton of primer overspray on it and I don't have a screenshot of it handy, but during this whole sequence, you can actually see the doors that are not on this car. You can actually see them in the background, um, just laying against the wall. So here we have the return for the last time of the portable kit TV box, the one we first saw in Soul Survivor and the one that we saw again in Junkyard Dog. And this is the last time we see it in the series. For some unknown reason, they decided not to use the integrated voice box here, but instead they wired up another voice box with a ribbon cable on the top. And here's the scene. During the uh, musical montage when they're repairing the car, you can see the hydraulic lines right here. Um, this is part of the high traction drop down setup. And another, just one of the many pieces we used to identify this car. And then there's this guy in the background here during Michael and, and uh, Marta's chat. This actually looks like um, Sandy McPeak from um, Short Notice, who played, uh, uh, what's her name, uh, Robin, Robin Curtis's dad. It's not him, but anyways, it looks like him, and it's blurry in the background. But I always thought this was interesting, because you watch this scene, and you think there's more to it. Like, this guy has some valuable information, because he, like, walks back and forth, and he keeps looking at them and then he looks in his briefcase and he looks back and and you think that you know he recognizes them or something and he he's going to come up to them with information but then that never materializes so maybe there was something after this that was cut but um, i haven't been, been able to find proof of that 
So here's where we were talking about the juggernaut. Well, I guess we saw the juggernaut earlier, but the, the additional grate that they added on the front, how they painted it this um, kind of this uh, dull green color. This is supposed to be Edward Mulhair climbing up in here, but it is obviously not. It's a stunt double. Um, I don't know if Edward just didn't want to have to climb up into this because we do see this guy climbing up into the juggernaut here. So I'm uh, guessing he just didn't want to do it. So this guy is going to hang up those cables and Michael's going to uh, grab him by the neck. The reason I point this out is not because of what you see, but what you hear. Um, during this scene, the sound effects that are playing are actually the sound effects from the bridge of the USS Enterprise from the original Star Trek series in the 60s. And I'm not sure why they chose those sound effects, but they did. So uh, there you go. Okay, Super Pursuit Mode. Jumping ahead, um, we've got, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't put a screenshot in for when Michael says, you know, something's in, something's in the backseat, mama's home hungry. That's the classic line from this episode, right? Um, anyways, so moving forward, we're up to the super pursuit mode. So many people say, well, where was this located in the car? Well, it wasn't located in any car. This was on a sound stage. It was an insert shot. If it had to be in a car, my guess would be, and based on where you see Hasselhoff pressing the button, where he's reaching for, my guess is this would be where the stock radio would be in a factory Trans Am. But in reality, it was never in a car. So then we see the car transforming. And what you may or may not realize is um, when, when this transforming Super Pursuit car is retracted and all the pieces are retracted, which you never see really in the show, it actually looks weird, right? Because you have all the seam lines of where the car's opening and the scanner is actually uh, embedded in the front of the bumper when normally there's a cutout on the top and the scanner sits in the cutout under the hood, not integrated into the bumper. So really this car looks odd whenever it's closed up, but it looks better when it's, you know, all apart. And, um, one thing I'm going to point out later, so they had two Super Pursuit Mode cars, right? They had one that didn't have an engine that was hydraulic powered, and that's the one you see in the close-ups. Then they had the full-time Super Pursuit car with all the pieces permanently uh, positioned in place that they would actually drive with. This car you're looking at here was the transforming one, no engine, and this was the same car that they dumped in the acid pit in Junkyard Dog. Um, take note of these openings here, right? So you see how they're like kind of rounded and the fins between them are a little thicker and how the, the bars between them, um, go out, you know, at a pair or a, a perpendicular from the angle of the, the sail panel, if that makes sense. Keep this in mind because later in the episode, we're going to show you how the design of, of this versus the design of the drive car was different. That probably just confused you a whole bunch, but hopefully it'll make sense when we get there. And for those of you not in the know, the fate of both of the Super Pursuit Mode cars, they were both destroyed when the show ended. They were both crushed under a wrecking ball. Any Super Pursuit Mode cars, I think um, Jay Orberg, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, built two i believe um he, they weren't from original molds they were it was it was an all new build um but neither of those cars were used in the show both of the original um super pursuit mode cars no longer exist got a bunch of miniature work here by sesams and slago and i always like to see they usually put in some kind of uh easter eggs right on on um their work. So what do we see here? For a good time, call someone. What is your quest? Mom, 723.85. This is probably, I'd have to go back and look. So this episode was filmed June 24th to July 16th. And I wouldn't be surprised if they filmed the miniature stuff after principal photography was done. That 72385 very well could be either the day it was filmed or the day they built this set for this scene. Wouldn't be surprised. And more, what do we see here? Elvis, Gross Prophet, Humpy, Chris Z, just, just names, graffiti on the uh, miniature work. So Devin and Evil Devin are coming in. This is supposed to be... Let's see if I can get a good look. Yeah, 
you, you barely get a look at it, but this is clearly, obviously, Edward Mulher's here. He can't be in two places at once in the same scene, so this is his stand-in, but uh, clearly not Edward, obviously. All right, a few more. What do we see here? This is that same wall. See, there's that 723.85, the mom, what is your quest? And then we go over here. We see um, Bev's birthday. Bev was Jack Sesum's wife. Um, and it's just a little too hard to read any of this other stuff. All right, so this is the drive car, obviously, and it had the working uh, EBS, emergency braking system, flaps. And you can see here, this was also kind of a sticker dash car. It had the, the, the dash in here, but they just put colored uh, stickers to make it kind of look like um, Kit's dash from afar. So naturally, just as most 80s shows go, Michael arrives just in the nick of time to stop the bomb. However, if you watch this, you see it's at two seconds. Michael rushes in, rips the wires off. But we hear two more beeps, meaning it would be down to zero and it would explode. But he rips this off and it's at one second, right? How convenient. But clearly, um, two seconds, beep, beep, and it would have gone off. So this whole area has changed immensely in the last 35, 37 years. This is, I think, East Wacker Drive because we see Kit and then we see him coming out here and you can see that same uh, dome building here and the same uh, curved high rise that we saw at the beginning of the episode. So with those two cues, you know, it's somewhere in, this is that lower Wacker Drive. I think Kit was, came out from under here and was driving off this way. But you can see this has all been developed. And a lot of these high rise, you can tell by the design that they're newer than 35 years old. So um, hard to find evidence of where this all took place, but it was in that general area. Michael then, or Kit plots out the Juggernaut's route. And if you look at the maps, he's actually plotting out wraps, uh, routes back in Hollywood, which is going to do them no good at all. So this is one of the extremely rare times. In fact, I think... This, the scenes here at the end of this episode, the only time we see the inside of the Super Pursuit Mode drive vehicle, which was the original Season 3 insert car. Um, and you can see how the rear hatch is open. There's some blackness here. You can see the um, overhead is just this kind of square block here with block-looking LEDs. Um, like I said, the only time in the series we see the inside um, where they film on the inside of the Super Pursuit Mode drive vehicle. All right, and once again, um, this is our car, our second car, uh, the Jay Leno, Jay Leno's garage car. It's easy to identify in these initial um, season four episodes because of that unique front bumper. And you can see here, it also does not have the stone, the Trans Am stone guards, which um, our car never had. All right, still our car something a really cool story regarding this so this is jack gill driving this this um driving our car in 1985. check this out all right so this is a really really cool shot in 2016 at southern nights atlanta jack gill was a guest and we took our screen used car down there this was jack reuniting with this car for the first time since the show ended and what's really neat is we got this picture of 1985 jack gill driving our car he's i'm sorry let me let me back up jack gill in 2016 sitting in our car holding a picture of himself driving that same car in 1985 that's how i wanted to say it um really really cool kind of meta moment here that we were able to put all that together turbo boost uh, obviously miniature work here and if you look closely we got s and s building products sesams and slagle building progress uh, building products nice little uh, easter egg there and then the miniature juggernaut is destroyed here so interestingly enough in the early 90s there was a very very short-lived tv show on fox called danger theater and um I remember it was described as like a cross between Knight Rider and Highlander or something weird like that. So I said, oh, I'll take a look at it. So I watched the pilot episode and in the opening credits of Danger Theater, they actually have this clip right here where the where the juggernaut's being destroyed. 
Um, and but that was pretty much the only attachment to Knight Rider. I never found any of the rest of the show even remotely like like Knight Rider, and I don't even think I watched the what the four or five episodes that aired before it got canceled. But um, check it out. Go on YouTube and search for Danger Theater intro, and um, you'll see this this clip in their opening theme song. Okay, once again, kind of the interior of the Super Pursuit Mode Drive vehicle. And this was I was ta- what I was talking about earlier, was what I was trying to describe. Look how radically different this opening is. The, um, the transforming Super Pursuit car, you know, it had these, these bars actually were perpendicular to the car like this. And each corner was rounded. Here, they just kind of welded in uh, pieces that were level, level to the ground, if that makes sense. Um, but you can also see the the opening there for the uh, EBS and just how thick you see how thick this is right here on a normal Trans Am you're not gonna have this much thickness between the top of the roof and the bottom of the headliner this was again to house the hydraulic mechanisms to open the the uh, EBS flap on the roof Michael then presses buttons to do the voice projection so the bad guys can hear him. The buttons he's pressing are for an overhead console that no longer exists in this car. This was a season two overhead console only. So this was obviously an insert shot from a couple years ago. So Michael saves the day and now we are at the ending scenes. Um, this car you see here is not a full car. It's actually a trailer convertible. And uh, let me show you a picture of what it actually looks like from far away. All right, so this is what they're actually in in that scene I just showed you. It's a car that they hacked up that allowed them to actually transform the roof from a hardtop to a convertible. This was not done. Um, it was all done by hand. There was a guy back here that would um, activate and, and do different things to make that work. I know there's a hydraulic pump here, or maybe just the initial version. You know, I could be wrong. Um, I actually think, you know, looking at this a little closer, um, we see this hydraulic pump here. So maybe, I don't think the entire transformation process from hardtop convertible was done uh, via hydraulics, but I think part of it probably was. But that's what you're looking at here. You can see it was on a trailer, like a boat trailer. There was no front to this car. Still the trailer convertible. You can see that they actually made it so the glass hatch tucks in behind it. It was pretty, really impressive. And for some reason, there's a red strip of tape on the uh, steering wheel there. And then the back piece kind of flies up. It almost seems like Hasselhoff's reaction almost seemed like, uh, like genuine, like, like, whoa, like this, you know, this almost hit me. I don't know. So, and then the convertible is debuted. This convertible still exists. It is in the Deezerland Museum in Orlando, Florida. Uh, it's one of the five that have survived. This is a, actually a V6 Firebird. And they never replaced the engine. It still has its original V6 engine in it. Uh, the only Knight Rider car that did not have a V8 in it. And the convertible would go on to be used, I think, in seven or eight total episodes. And that's it. And just like the Super Pursuit Mode car, this one had a bunch of stickers as well, which you can just kind of see there. And the episode ends with the first time we see the new um the the new outro scene i guess you could call it where the super pursuit mode car is coming at you in the desert they obviously went back out to el mirage desert to um film all these scenes with the super pursuit mode car and i seem to recall stories of i don't know if it happened during the filming of this but just in general how the car was just not well put together and and wings would fly off of it and different things so you know it's it definitely more for looks than for uh, functionality so
Okay, wow. Um, that was a huge, huge episode to cover. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope I didn't miss anything. I'm sure I missed something. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed it. We're going to continue on. You know, we are now in our last season of episode commentaries. So um, we're really going to enjoy them. And, you know, there's uh, there's some good episodes left in season four. There's some stinkers too. But uh, we promise to cover them all and cover them all we shall do. As always, if you made it this far, thank you so much for spending this time with us. We greatly appreciate it. Share this with your friends. Subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll talk to you next time.